moment and we're just waiting for confirmation that that is actually happening. Yep, we have confirmation that that's happening. So with your permission, Chair, I'll take this adherence from this morning's meeting of the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee of the 9th of November 2022. I can see that we have Councillor Allison here. Councillor Anderson is here. Councillor Barker. Nothing from Councillor Barker. I can see that Councillor Calicus is here. Councillor Chalmers is here. Councillor Clark is present, as is Councillor Cooper and Councillor Dewar. Councillor Fagan. Don't see anything from Councillor Fagan. Councillor Gowland is present, as is Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Keat. I'm advised that you're at the meeting. Councillor Lambie is at the meeting, as is Councillor Lockhart. Councillor Loudon is at the meeting, as is Councillor Mars and Councillor McDougall. Um, Councillor McAdams. Nothing from Councillor McAdams. Councillor Leslie MacDonald is here. Councillor Elaine McDougall is present, as is Councillor McGeever. Councillor Nugent is present. Councillor Zack is also present, as is Councillor Rob. I have apologies from Councillor Ross and I understand that Councillor Horsham is substituting for Councillor Ross and I see that you're at the meeting, Councillor Horsham. Councillor Salamati is at the meeting. Councillor Scott is at the meeting, as is Councillor Thompson. I have um, apologies from Councillor Margaret Walker and I understand that Councillor Carmichael is substituting and Councillor Carmichael, I can see that you're at the meeting. Um, I also see that Councillor Faulkner is at the meeting. Councillor Faulkner, can I just check that you are substituting for Councillor um, for Councillor Fagan? No, I'm just are you, watching you. You're here I'm as an observer. That's, that's absolutely fine. Thank you for confirming that. Councillor Miller, I see that you... Have your hand up. Is it to do with the sedirant? Yeah, you missed my name out, Pauline. Sorry, I'm so sorry about that. But yes, I have it. That you, I hear, have you here as a substitute. Um, who are you substituting for today? No, I don't believe I'm a substitute. Yes, Councillor Miller, you're a substitute. I'm you, a substitute. <laughs> um, I'm looking to see if any of your colleagues have... Um, substituting for John. No, I have a substitute for Councillor Ross, um, right. and that's the only substitute from um, your group that I have. Right, right. Okay, okay. Okay, is that all right? That, that means that you, you're free to leave unless you want to stay and observe. Hey. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, um, there are a number of officers present at today's meeting, and with that, Chair, I'll pass back to you for the business of the meeting. Thank you very much for that. Um, Warm welcome to everybody uh, to this meeting, particularly to our young people from uh, the Youth Forum on Climate Change Sustainability. Um, I'm going to name check you all here and apologies if there's any mispronunciations. We've got Luca Asadi, the Chair of the Youth Forum on Climate Change and Sustainability from Straven Academy, Luke Sutherland from Trinity High School in Rutherland, Amber Cooper from Trinity High School in Rutherland and Latifa Yakubu from St John Ogilvy High School in Hamilton. It's really great to have you all here. It's a hugely important issue. I know members uh, of the committee, many of us went down to to see the, the recent conference of schools in South Lanarkshire. He's done a fantastic job and we're really looking forward to the, today's presentation. So uh, enjoy it. We are delighted to hear from you. And yeah, with that, over to you. Well, I'll, I'll come back to in a wee second. But one thing I've got to do first, sorry, is to ask if there are any declarations of interest from members of the committee. OK, I don't see any. So moving on to agenda item two, minutes of the previous meeting, pages five to 14 of your pack. Uh, any comments? Nothing there. Uh, take it with it. I'll move those. Are we agreed? Agreed. And with that, then move on to agenda item number three, a presentation by our secondary school representatives from the Youth Forum of Climate Change and Sustainability. Over to you guys. Thanks. 
Good morning, everyone. So I was to say thank you so much for having us all here today in this in, in this committee room, and just for giving us a brilliant opportunity just to speak to you all today. And and like I said, we are from the Youth Forum on Climate Change and Sustainability (NSLC), and we've put together a presentation, as, as you can see, uh, free today, just to show to show you all the amazing things that we managed to do, but that we managed to achieve at the Climate Emergency Newsroom during COP26 last year, during the Youth Forum, during our monthly meetings that we've held, and most recently at COS1. And and we just hope to share it with you that what can be taken for the future within the council itself in terms of, be, of being proactive on, on sustainability and against climate change. And so without further ado, I say we should move on to the main presentation itself and just show you what, show you what we've prepared for you all today. And we just hope you enjoy. So these are going to be the main things we're talking about, just, just as an intro. So we're starting with an introduction, just as we'll introduce ourselves, where we're from, what, what role do we have in the forum, then we'll move, move on to talk about the Climate Emergency Newsroom, then we'll talk about the youth forum, all, me all the meetings we had, and cost one, the event itself, and to beyond cost one, what do we hope that, we, that premise skills will take on? And finally, we'll have a roundup plus questions if you, ha if you, ha if you have any. So just leave the introduction, so we go to the next slide. So as, as we said, my name is Luca Sadi. I am the chairperson of the Youth Forum on Climate Change and Sustainability, and I'm from Streaming Academy. Hi, my name is Latifa Yakubu. I'm a fifth year student at St John Ogilvy High School, and I'm part of the public relations team for the Youth Forum. Hi, my name is Amber Cooper, and I'm, from I'm an S3 people from Trinity High School. And I am one of the uh, three R's members of the COS1 group. Hi, I'm Luke Sutherland. I'm an S3 member of the forum. I'm from Trinity High School. So we'll be starting with talking about the Climate Emergency Newsroom, also known as CN, which, we, that, which was what we held last year during COP26. And we'll move on to the next slide, so just to talk about it a bit further. So just to give a bit of background about CN. So CN was a collaboration effort between the University of Glasgow's Department of Politics and International Relations and Social Actors Education Resources. And it was made in honour of Glasgow's function as COP26 host city, where about 86 pupils, including myself, attended to report on COP26's biggest stories, which was for, uh, for reporting in factual articles, live reporting at, at site, at, at the St Andrews Hall at the University of Glasgow and on the grounds, and also for insightful insight interviews with uh, council members such as yourselves and, uh, and also people from organisations and charities. And uh, Climate Emergency Newsroom, not only was a great opportunity, it was also a chance. It was just a chance for a massive group of like Essex of young people just to report on probably one of the biggest events I would ever actually attend in our lifetime. And to be able to report on the probably one of the most biggest diplomatic events to take part in Scotland, especially on an issue such as pressing as climate change and sustainability. It was a, it was an amazing opportunity, and for myself for myself as well to be grateful as as being a primary S six event as an S four people being being given the opportunity to take part and just to make articles, just to do it, conduct interviews, to report live live during protest, also man, manning the social media aspect of the of the newsroom. It was an amazing opportunity, and it laid the groundwork. To, con to continuing as the CN was right right after the start of the youth forum and it, it, it laid out laid out groundwork that was, benef was so beneficial into creating what we could hope for, for that, that that led on to the cost one and we move on to the next slide. Okay, so we have we have some, we have some pictures, just like uh, some some exa ex examples of what, what took place. We had, we had interviews with uh, like Lorna Slater, interviews with Tony, Tony McDade, and and also also a photo from when the main protests happened near near the end of the event. And we'll be going on to talk about the U form, and I'll ha hand, hand it to Latifa. So in October of last year, our youth form held our first in person meeting at the Hamilton Townhouse where we elected our chair and vice chairperson, our public relations team, as well as our secretaries. Throughout last year, we also undertook a, sust a sustainable pathways course, which was led by Kieran Armstrong. Kieran gave us some great tips on how to become influential young leaders, and he also taught us a lot about the circular economy. Next slide, please. After our in-person meeting, our focus shifted towards preparing for a cost one event. We kick-started our preparation by splitting our youth form into five groups, which we named the tiers. Tier stands for travelling, influencing, eating, 
reduce, reuse and recycle, also known as the three R's, and shopping. Our tiers were chosen to be these five factors as we strongly believe that these are the main things that we can act upon in order to combat climate change. Our youth forum members were split across these five groups and a leader was elected for each group. Here are just some pictures from our in-person meeting and it was a great opportunity for us to meet each other because it was the first time we'd ever met, met each other outside of Zoom calls and Microsoft Teams. So I'll pass on to Amber who's going to talk about our cost one event. So, at, so we're just going to talk about cost one now. So next slide, please. Um, so as Latifa stated, the tier stands um, that tiers is the main focus of cost one, and it stands for each of the groups we had, like said in the last few slides. So traveling, influencing, eating, reduce, reuse, recycle, and shopping. And each group had a different set activities that the children would rotate around throughout the day. Um, that they got a chance to experience for about 35 minutes for with each group and along with tears and the climate emergency newsroom we also had TEDx doing some little interviews with the kids and uh, VR headset activities. Next slide please. So this would just be some pictures of some of the activities. So groups like the traveling group had the they had a game where they had to keep the earth moving and they had electric bikes. The influencing group had a quiz and a couple of activities where they had to draw what their ideal world would be like and to write about it. The eating group had a milking the cow and a smoothie bikes activity. The three R's had a relay game where you had to reduce, reuse and recy uh, reuse, recycle and landfill, sorry. Um, T-shirt to bag activity and a bulb planting with old plant pots. And the shopping group had a dressing up the mannequins and a fashion show. And I'll hand you over to look now. And next slide, please. In my experience of the Cause One event, it was truly a great success and everyone enjoyed the event. However, Cause One is finished, it's over. All good things must come to an end. But what if they don't? It must at some point, point but why now? Cause One happened and it was great, but now comes the time to look beyond Cause One. What do we hope to happen? During the event, every pupil made their pledge, their promise of the things they do less of, more of and stop altogether in order to live more sustainably. An example of one of these pledges is, I will reduce everyday items creatively in any way I can to limit the amount I waste. Every pupil then brought these back to the schools. We hope these are being used effectively across the school to spread the message around to teach more and more people so they can make the changes in their daily life that will benefit the planet. Secondly, we hope to continue the Conference of Schools event and make it bigger and better each year or that each school will have their own event spreading their learning this will share the message and it will grow. Finally, the future of the forum. As a group, we hope to have monthly meetings and welcome new forum members to continue the strive for a greener South Lanarkshire. Yeah, so th these are these are a few of the photos taken at the Cosmo event, I believe, on the first day, and it was just showing some of the posters that primary schools have ma that made in, 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 in the run in the run up to the Cosmo event, and showing the, what have they done as a primary school in terms of being proactive in, in, in sustainability, and also what they hope for the future in terms of what this school are going to take. And yeah, it was it was a, it was brilliant seeing all the different schools and what 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 they believe that they could do themselves as in, as individuals, what they could do as schools, what they could do as community as well, and yeah. That, that was one of the biggest things that we took away from the, from the cost one event. And next slide, please. 
And yeah, that, that's near the end. So we'll have a roundup. So and then we'll have a few questions. I just want to say thank you so much for having us here today. It was it was generally a brilliant opportunity just to say what say what we've been, what we've been thinking, what was happening, go, going through the massive timeline of each and every opportunity and event that's happened, and what we what we hope that well, that will bring in terms of be in terms of sustainability and fighting against climate change within the council itself. And if you have any questions, it would be a great time to great time to ask, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer. Thank you very much for that, guys. Um, uh, it is really appreciated, and that was a fantastic presentation. Um, might have you back in at some point so that you can teach me something about public speaking. Uh, <laughs> that was really good. Well done. Um, I'm going to open it up to members for some questions. Um, I've got Councillor Lindsay Hamilton in the room first. Thanks uh, very much. I don't really know how to work this system, <laughs> so this is a funny room for us. So thanks very much, Mark, um, and thanks very much, guys, for coming along um, and having a chat about it. Um, myself and um, Gavin Keats, Councillor Keats, um, made it along on the Wednesday and the Thursday because we had so much fun on the Wednesday. <laughs> um, so we were really, really pleased about how busy it was and how much um, you all seemed to be enjoying it. We had a really good tour by Luca, so <laughs> thank you very very much um, for that um, and it was really really important because you could really tell how how engaged and how much fun everybody was having um, with all the events that was going on. It was really busy and um, so it's really good to, to let everybody know about how, how well it went but it is really important that we take forward like the learning from it and we take forward that um, how important this is for, for you, the young people in the schools and stuff like that so um, I'm really glad that the youth forum are, um, are keeping going and also that um, you are looking for the future and looking to, to do this yearly um, so we really do look forward to, to coming along um, and doing it again the virtual reality was my favourite freaked me out a wee bit but, so, <laughs> but thanks very much again and thanks for coming along Also probably, I'm, we're, we're really glad that you enjoyed it, you had a great time it is, it is amazing to think that this is an amazing opportunity for primary school, and like I can never imagine myself or any of you or any of you guys of having had this opportunity when we were younger. And the fact that as climate change continues to evolve into being so, so much more of a pressing issue, the reality the reality is that we need to have more events like this. We need to have more awareness of all the things that are currently happening. And speaking of opportunity as well for primary school primary school just to have fun, like be be more engaged, be more like be more. To just participating in, in things that they ha they'll begin to have more of an interest in, and to see to see that being reflected not only during the event itself, but now afterwards in terms of what they're going to do, in terms of all the feedback we've been getting, it's been it's been great, and really glad you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to come to Councillor Ross Clark. And um, before I do, actually, can I just actually point out um, uh, thanks to Councillor Clark, to Councillor Hamilton and Councillor Keats, um, who all suggested independently of each other that this might be a good idea today. Um, and I think it's worth giving you a wee bit of recognition. So cheers to each of you. Uh, Councillor Clark. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And uh, thank you for that presentation. It was re it was really good to hear a lot of the, the work, good work going on and what uh, and how we plan to build on that work going forward and uh, very well delivered as well. Uh, I, I was able to get along. Yeah, it was good to, it's generally it's good to have the, the youth form along to the uh, to the meeting. I know it was a cross party thing and it's really important to hear the voices of young people on this because young people are often said to be our, our future and that is true, but they're also our present as well and they deserve a voice right now. Uh, I was able to get along to the uh, the schools conference event as well on the on the second day and it was really good to see all the, the kids engaged and uh, a lot of the activities uh, were delivered by young people themselves and quite often uh, that's the best way other young people learn uh, and they seemed really engaged and it was also an opportunity for, for you guys as well to get that experience of delivering this sort of thing. Uh, I was interviewed by the, the young journalists so it's a good opportunity for them as well so it has a much wider uh, impact in terms of uh, volunteering as well. I'm just wondering if we could get a, a copy of that presentation as well supplied to all councillors. I think it, it might be useful. And my, my question is, my, my first question I'll put to kind of a uh, uh, officers is what more do we plan to do to support the work of the of the youth forum going forward and making sure they have a a, a meaningful voice 
uh, rather than just shouting out and no one listens to them. So like if they, they make um, make a request that we can show that we've considered it and actioned it, and if we haven't, then why not? Uh, and then secondly, on to, to, the, to the youth forum, what more do you guys want to see from us in terms of supporting your work and allowing you to do what you do best? And what action, more action do you want to see us take as a council on climate change? Uh, I think it'll be really useful to hear that sort of thing and also have that, you know, continuous, you know, scrutiny from from yourselves. Like, is, is the committee something you'd want to keep attending? Uh, and how more do you want to be involved in uh, the council's decision making? Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Clark. I'm going to go to David Booth first to answer the first year's questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Clark. And, and, and just before I answer, if I could also thank, pass on my thanks to the young people for such a, a fantastic presentation. It was really excellent. Thanks for that. Um, Councillor, um, Councillor Clark, in, in, uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Ross, in ter- uh, Councillor Clark, in terms of the um, the ongoing work in respect of this, um, the council, uh, in addition to this forum, has a number of officer forums um, where we deal with climate change and sustainability. Most prominent amongst them is the Climate Change and Sustainability Steering Group. And that, that uh, group is represented, uh, There's a, every resource in the council is represented in that group, including education resources. Uh, who are represented by a uh, uh, Lynn Sherry, who's one of the heads of service in that that um, service and that resource. Um, and Lynn regularly, I don't know if they can hear me when I'm talking. Is that it? Should I just stop just now? I can just stop you there. Thanks, David. Uh, just can we check uh, that members attending remotely can actually still hear what's going on in the committee room? I can hear, but no. Yeah, yes, uh, yeah. the, the, the pictures just came back. The picture was away for a second, but I can hear okay. Uh, thank you very much, guys. It's uh, yeah, it dropped out here, but we could see on the, the clerk's laptop that you were still present, but we would lost you in the in the room on the bigger monitor. So you are back now, uh, and I'm glad to hear you heard all of that. So back to David. Okay, thanks very much, Chair. Um, uh, so in in Councillor Clark, in terms of uh, this forum, which is a climate change and sustainability steering group, and we meet on a regular basis with representation right across the council. Every resource is represented. Uh, Lynn Sherry represents education resources uh, and through that forum uh, Lynn regularly updates us on the work of the Pupil Forum uh, and and we talk at some length about how we can involve uh, and that's why in terms of uh, some of the events that we're, we're having and some of the events that the Youth Forum will, will, will hope to have planned and we try and make sure there's a good cross-section of council officers uh, across each of the council services uh, at hand and available um, to work with the, the young people and with the schools to take forward the agenda. So um, that, that, that's what we do at the moment. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, David. And I'll move back to, to yourselves. Oh, so uh, so um, going, back, going back to Clark's question, it's like at the, at, the, at the near the end of the day, we had quite a few children come up come up to us, and it was you know, giving us a few comments. And they're saying one of the, one of the biggest things that they, that they enjoyed was that it was young young people giving giving the lessons, to, like leading the activities the, all all around the the event. And seeing from that, it's like something that I realised that cl- climate change by itself, as an issue and as a subject, is covered of layers is one of the most is a very in-depth issue and subject that to, for a lot of primary school children can seem very very daunting and what we, what we hope is that we can break down those boundaries that between understanding and approaching climate change especially from a young a very young perspective and being making it a daunt, make it daunting it seems like there won't be not there's nothing that it is possible that they can do to be active, and we can want to, to change change that change that aspect, change that perspective, and having all these having all these activities and events, and and, and it's f- focused on each region of sustainability, where it's where it's traveling, where it is influencing, where it's eating, recycling, is things that they can do them, themselves as an individual. They can do at home. They can do at school. Yeah. So there's so there's so many areas that they can work on and. Especially in a global perspective, it can seem as if their impact has very little to, towards the global effort. When really, 
it's, it's, it's so it's so much that they can do, and it's so much that they can impact and make a difference. And that is really that, that's why we wanted to inspire them. That's why we wanted to that, that's why we wanted to change their their perspective on it. And that was just one of the biggest things that we that, that we took away from it. And we hope we hope that in terms of the council itself and the committee, it's just giving more support. It's just like having that constant communication, have that constant have that constant focus and that, and that willingness to listen to us and to listen to what we secondary school people have to say and what primary school people have to say as well and just it's so, there's so many things that you can do and that, that's what the tears represent that, that's what the tears represented that the fact there is so much we can do and if we focus on the curriculum if we can adapt some if we can adapt more about sustainability and climate change in the curriculum itself and to talk to people to the fact that there are so many impacts towards climate change where that is environmental where that is human and we need to have that practical approach to it as well that while climate change is so much theoretical it is so much practical as well and we need to have we need to have that approach to it and, and in fact we can involve for we can involve some people that so we can we can take they can all take part in being more proactive and if we can focus that on the curriculum across school across secondaries and people in primary schools and focus, focus more on the, on senior staff what, what can they do to help promote this make sure that people are involved make sure that they are able to communicate and promote all this information and that is really the, that's the end day it's all about communication it's all about promoting and, and making people aware of the issue in the first place and then having awareness leads to the action that, that's created it and yeah that's all we hope and i hope that answered your question thank you that was that was really helpful Right. Um, I had requests to speak there from councillors Cooper, Rob, and Thompson. Um, Margaret, your hands went down. You, um, I presume you're no longer wanting to speak on the issue. I, I just wanted to oh, thank okay. the young people for coming along this morning, and uh, they should be very proud of themselves. They're good ambassadors for their school and for their uh, the the council here, and uh, I hope they continue the good work that they've started out on, and we'll give as much support to them as we can uh, to allow them to take that further. Uh, the second thing I was going to say was it would be nice if the camera could focus on the speaker. I haven't seen the chair of the meeting. Uh, it seems to be off centre and that's quite frustrating. I realise there's issues regarding the IT system this morning, but uh, the, 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 a number of us are experiencing the, the chair away off the, the right hand side of the screen and we can't see him. And it's not that I don't like David Booth, etc., but uh, he's not chairing the meeting. So thanks for that. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Margaret. I, as you say, it is uh, technical difficulties, I'm afraid, and um, I, I'm not sure if I'm off to the far right or the far left. Hopefully, neither. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's me in the middle now. I've fixed it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to Councillor Rob. Thanks. Just to come back on um, Councillor Clark's question and uh, the response from the Youth Forum as well, in terms of some specific things which we could do perhaps is maybe to get a report back in a year to the committee, if that would be acceptable, um, on how you've been getting on. Because I know there's actions going back to primary schools and they're coming up with how the council can help them deliver on their actions. So I think it'd be quite useful to hear what's happened in maybe in a year's time or an appropriate time scale that you think is best. Um, I know the council have also employed a sort of sustainable communities person to link in with communities and uh, engage wider in the community about, about these matters. So it might be uh, useful and we can have ongoing discussions about how youth are brought into that type of forum. Um, I think it's still developing, isn't it? But certainly we can think of ways to bring young people into, which is absolutely important. As I said in the, our chat beforehand, it's very important. Young people need to push the boundaries and I'm so excited and a little bit emotional about you being here and uh, very proud of what you've achieved. Thanks very much, Kirsten. And finally, I'm going to go to uh, Councillor Bert Thompson. Are you with us? You're on mute, Bert. If you're, if you're there, thanks. You're still on mute. Right, okay, uh, I'm going to just. Uh, I think we can't actually can't hear for you, unfortunately, Bert. But thanks anyway. Um, right, well, I'm just going to. Um, 
say again, thanks very much uh, for coming and, and presenting this to us. It's a hugely important issue. It's great, as members have said, to hear uh, from the Youth Forum and we look forward to um, hearing from you again uh, as in the, the years to come. Um, I hope personally you all got something out of this today. Um, it really is uh, great for us to hear from you and it's such an important issue. So thank you for your time. Cheers. And Um, you don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting, you are, you are, uh, but um, thanks very much for coming along. Um, so with that, councillors, I'm going to move on to agenda item number four, which is the Good Food Strategy Update. It's a monitoring item and it's on pages 15 to 40 of your uh, packs. And with that, I will invite Gillian Simpson to speak. Thanks, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, the purpose of this report is to update committee on the status of the Good Food Strategy actions and measures as at quarter two of 22-23. And the report is for monitoring and noting today. Section three of the report provides some background information, reminding us that the Good Food Strategy was approved by the Executive Committee in December 2019 and that it covers a five-year period from 2020 to 2025. The vision for the strategy can be found in paragraph 3.2 and the key themes and objectives are presented in paragraph 3.3. The action plan which we were reporting on today was approved by this committee at its last meeting back in August 22. An update on the actions and measures for the first half of the year is available in section 4. Paragraph 4.2 firstly provides a summary of the statistical measures as at the end of quarter 2, with seven measures showing a green status indicating that the target has been met or is on track. One measure has an amber status and this relates to the level of uptake of school meals in the secondary schools. Um, the year-to-date figure as at quarter two is 39% against a target of 47. Um, uptake has been lower since the pandemic and this is in line with the national trend. Um, however, the level of uptake is improving and in period six alone, which was the last month of quarter two, the uptake was 44%. There are no red statistical measures as at quarter two. Um, there are 14 measures which will be reported later at quarter four or are being reported for contextual purposes only. Paragraph 4.5 provides a summary of the improvement actions or the project based measures. Um, so as at the end of quarter two, one of those measures is blue, meaning the measures um, are the actions complete. 16 measures show a green status and two measures are amber. Um, and as noted in section 4.6, both of these measures relate to planning projects. Um, the first one is the audit or for the development of the open space strategy, which ties in with food growing opportunities. This had been delayed um, just due to the resources um, required to carry out the audit, which has been quite significant um, as a significant piece of work given the size of our council area. However, the audit is now nearly complete and so we can expect a more detailed update on this at quarter four. The second AMBER action um, is about working with local communities who are preparing local place plans in order to identify potential food growing opportunities locally. Uh, the development of the local place plans, um, however, is dependent on local communities and their desire to produce such, such a plan. And interest has been pretty limited so far, and that's why the action has been identified as AMBER at this stage. Um, but I understand that this level of uptake has been the case across other local authorities as well. Um, when the Council starts its formal preparations of the next local development plan, which will be around springtime, um, planning will at that stage formally invite all community bodies to prepare and submit a local place plan. And it's a requirement we do that within the Planning Scotland Act. Um, and then any local place plans that are submitted will be taken into account as we prepare the new local development plan. But these local place plans can be produced um, at any time. They don't need to wait until they're formally invited. Um, so the planning service are going to start promoting on the council website to highlight the two communities that they can create local place plans and um, to give them more say on the development in the local area, which could, of course, include identifying potential food growing opportunities. Um, there's one action which is to be reported later, and that is the midterm review of the good food strategy, which will be undertaken later this year. Progress on all the objectives, actions and measures is set out in Appendix 1 and Paragraph 4.8 gives an overview of some of the key achievements so far against each of the themes within the strategy. So this includes the summer hub sessions, which ran with 14, within 14 locations for six weeks during the summer, with breakfast and lunch served each day to over 800 children. And food related learning programmes have been delivered by education and social work through the Youth, Family and Community Learning Service and the Unpaid Work Service, and they've already surpassed the annual target in terms of the number of learners. 
Analysis has been undertaken by a consultant on the capacity of local food and drink businesses to supply food to different council buyers. This has involved consultation with council services, local businesses and other external partners. And results from this have been presented over the next couple of weeks and the next steps will then be considered. In terms of the good food economy, 95, sorry, 96% of food businesses were compliant with the food safety statutory requirements at quarter two. And economic development has supported 62 local food and drink businesses by providing advice and signposting them to the relevant services. Good food growing and um, progress in relation to good food growing, including the number of people involved in food growing and the size of land made available for food growing, is now being reported annually to allow for better monitoring. And the waste education team have reviewed the materials which are presented in primary schools to include a selection on food waste journey to emphasise the need to reduce food waste. Um, so if I can just refer you back to the recommendation section two, which is at the quarter two update for the 2022-23 action plan in respect of the actions and measures within the good food strategy be noted. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Gillian. Um, we've got requests to speak from councillors Chalmers and Mars. So if I can go to yourself, Maureen, first, councillor Chalmers. Thanks, Chair. Um, it was just about page 26, um, the referrals to specific food initiatives. So it's the food insecurity section of the report. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a wee bit of cold. Um, and I appreciate this is the figures from Money Matters. I'm conscious that um, there will be other parts of the council, I'm thinking of social work and housing, who also make referrals to um, food-related referrals. Um, now, I know that at the CPP level, <clears throat> we have a wider range of partners referring in, but I'm just wondering if we feel we're capturing all the council's data around about food insecurity in this item here, or if we can improve that in any way. David would like to come in on that. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair thank you very much, Councillor uh, Chalmers. Um, I, I think we'll, what we'll do is we'll take we'll take that away and we'll, we'll look and see if there's any other information that we can harvest to go into the report. Um, the information we've got at the moment is coming from those partners that, that where we can provide the, the statistical data to put into the report. But um, as you say, that's a, that's quite a, a change in picture in terms of the food insecurity, just given. Um, the, the cost of living crisis that many are facing at the moment. So there may be other data that we can we can pick up from other areas and we'd like to present as we move forward the most accurate and up-to-date yeah. information that we can. Thanks. That's exactly the point. Thanks very much, David. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Um, Councillor Mars. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I could um, ask a question on, on um, the hot composters on page 18 um, of the papers. Um, I'd be keen to understand the um, the initial numbers that that uh, strategy is focusing on and perhaps the, the wider scope of how many people will be able to access that, that scheme and, and how they will be able to get information and publicity regarding that. I'm going to go to Kevin Carr. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor. Yeah, yeah. So we got permission, obviously, and approval through the investment fund for this project, um, and we broke the the purchase of the hot cob posters into lots rather than purchasing them all in the one. So the first lot, actually, we've just received the 500, um, but it will be open to all householders in Clydesdale. So. I think I gave an update at the last committee that we're aiming by the turn of the year to have been through the recruitment process for the project, um, as well as having them in stock. And then by the turn of the year, we'll be going out to market um, the opportunity for local residents. So over time, it will be open to all residents, but we'll bought the first batch in just to determine the, the level of interest. Thanks very much. Um, Councillor Gowland. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to see the good progress of the good food strategy. Uh, as the food champion for South Lanarkshire, I've had an in-depth in induction from the policy officer and I've met with a range of stakeholders and look forward to meeting with a range of <clears throat> a range of our small businesses across South Lanarkshire to encourage uh, close working with the council. Um, on page 28 of the report, a note from and a note from my meetings with council officers that many are on waiting lists to access allotments across South Lanarkshire and I note the aim to uh, increase the post holders and the area of council land made available to food growing sites is welcome and it's to in increase by 10% uh, the allotment users, which is something which I think is quite important because, like I said, there's lots of people across South Lanarkshire um, uh, that 
or um, want access to allotment and uh, the comment at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks very much, Councillor Go and, uh, David Booth would like to reply to that. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Gowland. The, um, just uh, as you say, we're, 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 it's, it's a kind of work in progress, this. We're looking at an area and a by area basis, and um, we just recently brought to uh, one of the Community Enterprise Resources Committee's um, proposals to put additional food growing areas within uh, what was previously the Dobie site at Chartleroe. So, um, so we'll continue to do that uh, and, and look at different areas as we try and uh, expand and make available um, food growing opportunities to, to the communities because we know that people are keen to do that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I just want to say on this item as well, in page 17, I think is uh, a bit of credit due for the Youth Family and Community Learning Service and Education. Um, it had a target of delivering uh, services to 220 learners over the first six months of the year and actually managed 567. So that's not only, um, you know, green status. I think it's green status with a gold star and really ought to be mentioned. So uh, congratulations to everyone involved in that. Um, can I move the report? Yeah, sure. Second. So I'll second that. Uh, well, I agree the report. Thank you. Right, moving on now to item uh, number five. It's an item for decision. Public Bodies Climate Change Duties Annual Report. I'm going to invite Julie Richmond to speak. It's on pages 41 to 72 of your facts. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, the purpose of this report is to present uh, the Council's annual Public Bodies um, Climate Change Duties Report for financial year 21-22, and the recommendation is that the report be approved. Section 3 of the covering report provides the legislative background on the duties of the Council under the Climate Change Acts of 2009 and 2019, and, uh, which is that all public bodies in Scotland have a duty to re reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to a change in climate and act sustainably, and that the public bodies should prepare an annual report on compliance with these duties and publish and submit the report to Scottish Government. So the report is based on a template issued by Scottish Government and has been completed and submitted to Scottish Government since 2015 and it contains six sections. A full copy of the Climate Change Duties Report can be found at Appendix 1. So Section 4.4 of the Covering Report provides some highlights which are included within the Climate Change Duties Report and these include reporting that our uh, carbon footprint in the Council has reduced by 64%. Um, in 2021-22 compared with the baseline year of 2005-06. Um, it talks about the residual waste contract that's enabled a large proportion of our non-recyclable waste to be sent to the energy from waste plant rather than going to landfill. Um, it talks about the significant levels of renewable energy that are being generated and consumed within our buildings either from solar PV or biomass technology. Um, it details the fact that we have got a robust climate change and sustainability governance structure led by this committee and supported by the Climate Change and Sustainability Steering Group. And it talks about the robust strategic environmental assessment process that ensures all of our plans, our policies and our strategies undergo an environmental assessment, which includes considering climatic factors. Section 4.5 of the covering report outlines how the Council's own carbon footprint is measured from the five sources. It's energy consumption from our buildings, disposable, disposal of our household waste, uh, the energy consumption from street lighting and the emissions associated with fleet and staff travel. And the climate change duties report goes into more detail on this within section three. Sections 5, 6 and 7 of the covering report detailed employee financial and climate change and environmental implications. Uh, and following uh, committee approval today, it's the intention to publish the report, which is attached um, on the Council's website and then submitted to Scottish Government by the deadline of the 30th of November. So back to the purpose of the report, which is to present this um, this annual public uh, bodies climate duties report for 21-22 and recommending that the report be approved. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Julie. Uh, can I invite uh, any members who wish to speak to put their hands up? Um, Councillor Gowland. Thank you, Chair. Um, in December 2020, 
and the council considered a motion regarding a proposal for South Island to become a pesticide free council. Uh, can officers let the committee know about next steps and actions regarding the following? Uh, the review of glyphosate based products, that's the 10% target reduction that was committed to, and also opportunity, opportunities to introduce Mancar Ultra Low Volume Lance Alternative and a Hot Form Alternative, and also attempts to rewild in rural areas and what the council can do to support biodiversity in hedgerows and also by the side of roads. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm aware that this issue is actually um, due for a, a report back in February at the next council meeting, uh, the next committee meeting, sorry. So um, I'm not sure there'll be much to be said before that, but I will ask um, David uh, to, to speak to it if he wishes. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Gowland. Yes, um, there's a, so, so yes, you're absolutely correct. We officers have been have been working on the, the outcomes of the, the report you referred to, Councillor, um, and we are scheduled um, to bring a report on our progress to date at the next uh, meeting of this forum, uh, which is uh, as the chair uh, states is in February, and we'll have a we'll have a full report on on how far we've got along that journey at that point. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, do we have any other uh, requests to, to comment from members online? Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Gowland, do you want to come back in? OK, uh, no worries. Um, Councillor Rob. <clears throat> Thanks very much for all, all the work on the report. Uh, another good report. Um, I would just to ask, given the energy bills that we're, the Council's facing, yeah, if there's any opportunities this winter to, to build on the work that's already been done on energy efficiency to help staff or in buildings to cut energy use a little bit more um, and uh, save save some money for frontline jobs just to see if there's anything quick and easy to do, shout outs and support for staff to reduce energy bills in the council. David. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Rob. The uh, I, I mentioned when, when uh, responding to the question um, about what more could be done for the youth forum, the a forum that exists at the moment. The, the we are within council officers. We look at uh, climate change and sustainability. Um, we met on Monday uh, and we discussed that very subject about uh, how do we try and uh, continue to um, to be much more efficient in terms of our, our, our council buildings. Um, and one of the areas that we're looking at and we're going to discuss at the next meeting is reintroduction of, uh, of champions for resources so that in each resource there's someone who um, will kind of lead for that resource about just just some of the, the items that you discussed uh, or you mentioned there, Council Rob, which is about, uh, about being uh, efficient, uh, about the, the use of energy, the use of a temperature, the setting of temperature in buildings, um, you know, what lights are going on, what lights are going off. So we can continue to work on that uh, and it is a matter that's in hand at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, David. Um, I don't see any other requests to speak, so I'll just ask the committee to agree the report. Agreed. Uh, now, moving on to agenda item six, another item for decision, the Clyde uh, Climate Clyde Forest Concordat. You'll find it in pages 73 through 84 of your packs. I'd like to invite Kevin Carr to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Morning, committee members. The purpose of today's report is to note the Glasgow City Region Cabinet Report and the first year progress of the Clyde Climate Forest Initiative. Note the development of the Climate Forest Glasgow City Region Concordat and seek approval to endorse the Concordat. Clyde Climate Forest was launched by the Glasgow City Region Cabinet in June 2021 with a headline target of 18 million trees over the next decade. The aim of the Climate Forest is to enable and coordinate an approach that will deliver a major increase in tree planting across the city region. South Lanarkshire is an important stakeholder in the Clyde Climate Forest with the Council convening the Canopy Working Group and representing that group on the Clyde Forest Steering Group. The first year of the initiative has now been completed and an update report is included in Appendix 1. Experience from the first year has led to the development of a concordat noted in Appendix 2 that aims to provide further clarity in the purpose of the Clyde Climate Forest with clear commitments, roles and responsibilities in pursuit of specific objectives. The concordat commitment aligns well with the Council's own objectives and aspirations 
and has now been endorsed by the Glasgow City Region Cabinet at its meeting on the 30th of August. Local authorities are now asked to approve the Concordat with formal signing planned around National Tree Week at the end of the month. If approved, an internal officer working group will be established to progress the Council's commitments to take forward the Clyde Climate Forest Initiative. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, I know members, uh, many of us attended an awareness session on this issue not so long ago. I found that hugely informative. Um, I think it is a great example of uh, local authorities working in partnership to deliver a, a region-wide benefit. Um, and with that, I'll ask uh, for uh, any questions or comments from the committee. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Thanks, Chair. With many local authorities embarking on significant tree planting programmes all over the UK, not just in Scotland, there are concerns about the ability to meet tree planting targets due to a lack of homegrown stock. Do we have a locally produced stock that does not risk importing exotic pests and diseases such as Dutch elm and dye ashback? Or is there something within the region, if not within South Lanarkshire, that the nurseries or whatever will produce these? Uh, saplings. Thanks very much, Councillor. Um, I actually attended a Network Rail event not too long ago where they were talking about ash dieback and the, the huge problems that poses for uh, the canopy, uh, you know, uh, protecting uh, the, the railway. Um, so it's certainly a question that um, is a worthy one. Um, I'm going to go to Kevin. Thanks. To the question, Councillor Anderson, yeah, in the past, councils tended to have their own nurseries for growing uh, trees to be locally planted. It's not something more than a number of years. Um, but you're right to bring in some of the other issues because it's it's national issues that we're all wrestling with. We have a couple of papers internally on ash dieback in terms of how we deal with that over the next decade. And we're hoping to receive additional funding next year in the capital programme to start to deal with that so we can think about it more strategically. And we've also put a funding request in for starting to think about the recovery from it. So at the moment we're dealing with the urgent issues, but we need some some finance and actually some space to think about how we deal with it strategically and what types of planting we, we put in once we've dealt with the issue. So we're probably at the early days of putting all of that together in terms of developing a strategic approach. And again, it's all aligned with the work that we're doing in the climate forest um, and a, the canopy strategy that will be under development uh, directly also. So... Hope that answers your question. Do you want to come back in, John? Yeah, well, I'm just wondering uh, when we would start because I mean, uh, if we're going to start nurseries or whatever, uh, start with the trees. We need to start right away. You talk to us something like I think 18 million trees that need to plant. It's a lot of trees, uh, and the sooner we start that, I think the better. If, if we're going down that road, rather than importing trees. Uh, which would cause maybe all sorts of problems further down the line. Uh, Kevin? So, so at the moment we plant around 20,000 trees in, every year in South Lanarkshire. So, so you're right, the commitments that we'll be signing up to this is, is looking longer term about how we increase that pretty dramatically. So that's certainly something we'll pursue through the, the city region because I think there's maybe probably a benefit to working together on that with all authorities rather than, than just ourselves. Okay, uh, Councillor Alex Allison. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, 18 million trees over the next decade is certainly a significant number, as John has highlighted. But what's important is not the number of trees, but the amount of carbon that is sequestrated. Uh, trees are good at that, but for it to be a benefit to our community and reducing the amount of carbon, we also have to take into account what happened on that land before the trees were planted. Um, is any work being done on that? Because trees are not always the most efficient way of sequestrating carbon. Also, what has been displaced on that land for the trees to be grown? Because if we're simply moving, for instance, food production elsewhere, the transport carbon uh, of then bringing that food in could mitigate anything that uh, is, 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 is being done in growing trees. So what are we doing to ensure that we are actually making a benefit to carbon sequestration and not simply growing trees for trees' sake? Thanks very much, Alex. I'm going to go back to Kevin Carr again. 
Thanks, Councillor Allison. Um, it's a really good question, but we're still at the very early days, I think, of this the Clyde Climate Forest, the be its objectives, long-term objectives, and also of ourselves in terms of developing a canopy strategy. So we're not quite at the point where we've done any of that in scale yet. Um, there's a report, at the, the the final report's got a short update in some of the work that we've already done through the Clyde Climate Forest, which was 4,000 trees that were planted in three target areas um, in South Lanarkshire last year in three of our urban areas. But we're still at the very early days of scaling that up. Um, but all of your questions, I think, will need to be taken into account in terms of making sure we're getting the maximum benefit out of the areas that we're, we're planting in, including looking at what the baseline was before. Uh, Alex, you want to come back in? Yeah, just to make a further comment, surely that is work that needs to be done before uh, we go down a particular path, path pathway. Trees may be the answer, but until we do that work, we don't know. And if we plant these trees if John can get enough saplings in, it is very difficult then to bring that land back out to forestry if it is not a positive carbon sequestration way, way forward. We need that information before we go down this line. Thanks, Alec. Uh, I've got David Booth indicating he'd like to respond to you. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Allison, for your question. So I think the, what the concordant does is it's a high-level commitment to, in terms of, of taking a forward. So as, as Kevin's explained, um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done is to understand, you know, A, where is the land, what was on before the land, what we're going to do uh, with land, where are we going to source all these these, these trees as well. Um, what, what I would point out and say is that, the, um, and, and you're right when you say as well that, that trees wells um, are good in that respect are not the only solution in that and there is also other work that we're involved in across a whole range of different factors including looking at, at peatlands uh, of which there are many in South Lanarkshire and how we make sure that they uh, that they're not degraded and we look at, at ways of actually uh, where possible increasing um, that because of the carbon sequestration that comes from that so this is I suppose this is what this is at the moment is a bold statement uh, of of intent um, at the city region uh, level, um, uh, as I kind of concord it between all of the authorities in the city region partnership to say um, that we'll we'll go down the, this route. But I think what we'll, you know some you're asking, but we will only find that the answers to them as we go through the process and we and we start to to develop the initiative. Thanks. Thank you. I've got a request to speak from councillors Rob, Lambie and Lockhart. Um, so I'm going to go to councillor Rob first. Thanks. Um, just a wee bit help on that last point. Um, I think the mantra with tree planting is the right tree in the right place. So all, all the um, questions you raised should be looked at in that process, uh, councillor Allison. Um, but also let's think about beyond carbon as well. All of this is the climate committee. We're trying to see the links to the benefits of trees. Uh, beyond carbon as well, um, albeit they have a good effect as well. So I think that's why the Clyde Climate Forest has been looking at, you know, areas of deprivation where there's maybe a lack of green spaces as well. So to, br to bring the benefits of trees, we're all going to need trees for shade, reducing flooding, um, and they just benefit biodiversity and quality of life as well. So uh, the Clyde Climate Forest is trying to meet all these aims, and I'm sure they'll take all those account into account to get the right trees in the right place. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Lambie. Hi, thanks, Chair. Um, so my wife and I, we planted 70,000 native Scottish broadleaf trees. So we are in the fortunate position that we are carbon negative for life. Um, 70,000 trees sounds a lot, but in comparison to 18 million, it's uh, a drop in the ocean. But it still took us about four years to get through all the bureaucracy um, to make that happen. Because like that, to echo the concerns about Alec, you know, you, you have to justify that you can plant on this land and that land can't be used for future food production or grazing, etc. But not just that, you have to speak to that RSPB, make sure that open meadowlands are not better served for our bird population. You need to do the soil investigations, um, a vegetation survey to check the flora and fauna, and viral impact assessment as well. So just on my experience, um, for the 18 million trees, you're you're talking, you know, five to ten million pounds in professional fees just to get all the 
well, they passed all the legislative hurdles. But I'm still in favour, obviously. Um, my question really is, have you guys reached out to the Woodland Trust? Because they are very helpful charity that provide professional service up front um, for, for a very, very min minuscule uh, cost. That's my question, really. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Councillor. It's interesting to hear the personal experience you've got on this front as well. Actually, I wasn't aware of that and look forward to chatting to you about that at some point. If we can go to Kevin Carr for a response. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Councillor Lambie. Um, that's pretty commendable. 70,000 trees, I think you've planted more than a lot of councils, most councils. Um, to answer your question, yes, they are involved. Um, we work close with them personally as a council, but they're also heavily involved with the Clay Climate Forest. Um, they're part of that steering group that have created the Concordat, um, along with the Scottish Forestry Commission, Green Action Trust, Trees for Cities um, as well. So th there's a wide range of stakeholders involved in, in the development work for this long-term commitment. Does that answer your question, Ross? Would you like to come back yeah, in? Yeah. Just a quick follow-up. Um, the, the problem we're having just now is because you have to keep replanting you know, as you go on through the years. It's when you're doing the native mixed schemes, it's getting hold of all the species you're going to require at the right time. Because my experience is that the nurseries are geared towards commercial plantations. So in other words, giving you a million trees of the exact same species. So the challenge I've found is actually trying to find sufficient nurseries with the variety and the numbers available at any given time. So the concerns about the um, ability to procure the saplings, yeah, that's something we really need to look into. Thanks very much. I'm going to go to David Booth on that one. Again, th thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for that point, Councillor uh, Lambie. And also picking up uh, Councillor Allison's earlier point, I do think that there's um, as well as some challenges around about that. Um, there, there may be some, um, some opportunities from an economic development perspective in terms of nurseries, in terms of uh, supplying uh, enough saplings to be able to meet the objectives uh, of this initiative. So uh, I think there's some uh, some mileage for me to take this away and, and discuss with my economic development uh, colleagues about about how do we kind of create the capacity uh, in order to, to self-deliver on some of that. So I think there may be an opportunity in that as well. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, if I could just add to that, I think there's a lot of good points being made here and it would be interesting to get some more information on exactly what's uh, happening uh, circulated to members of the committee. I, th I think it would make interesting reading, um, so look forward to that. Um, Councillor Lockhart. I thank you, Chair. I think we're all saying the same thing. Um, certainly the rural people are probably more aware than many of what the issues are. I've planted God knows how many thousands of trees where I am, but the one area that I do find we need to spend more time on is looking at I don't know whether you call it a conflict but I think making sure there are proper discussions if you like between the those who are looking at the rewilding for instance versus those who want to to plant trees because they pretty much conflict with each other I think the use of land has got to have far greater study for instance I see miles and miles and miles of what I call black woods these endless pine tree um, plantations. Now, they create an eco-desert. They are the most ghastly um, thing for, for nature and for wildlife because they just kill everything underneath it for miles and miles around. And I think there should be far greater, I, I don't know what you will, consultation between the various bodies that are looking at planting these trees in terms of managing the shape, the size, the mix of the trees that are planted because just to go out and plant trees themselves is not very necessarily effective apart from anything else it takes 10 years before a plantation gets to the stage of absorbing the same um, carbon as one acre of grass so you're missing out on 10 years of carbon absorption on a bit of grassland that you turned into trees a lot of things to think about and i don't think there's a lot of joined up thinking yet Thanks very much for that, uh, Richard. I think David Booth wants to come back in. Thank, thanks very much, and uh, thanks very much, Councillor Lockhart, for, for for that point. Um, yes, I, I think you, what you're describing is this is this certainly could get you know in terms of the different initiatives around about this, it could become quite a cluttered landscape very quickly. 
uh, with a lot of, a lot of different organisations uh, uh, not not connecting with each other. If I can give some assurance um, again through Kevin uh, and his his team uh, and from my own climate sustainability team uh, within the resource as well, um, we're engaging with a whole range of different. Uh, on a whole range of different initiatives and, and there's uh, is a, that delicate balancing act to making sure we get that right and I do genuinely appreciate some of the, the input particularly from r- rural uh, elected members um, who are, are closer to these um, to these issues so we will take we'll take these points on board and we will make sure that um, that we we you know we, we, we try and make sure that these partnerships work and uh, connect up to each other uh, and we get the best outcomes that we can thanks Thank you. Do you have a supplementary, Richard, or has that answered your question? No, no. I, I just I hope that's what happens. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, if I could just add to that, that um, I think there's some really interesting things coming out of councillors here, and um, it is good to see that level of scrutiny into this. I think there's broad agreement that we want to see uh, increased canopy and a region-wide uh, joined-up approach to it. Um, so I certainly hope that the, the points and the concerns made will be fed back uh, to city region level, the city region cabinet, uh, and I, th- I thank members for their, th- their thoughts on that. Um, can I ask members to agree the report? We're agreed. Okay, with that, um, we're moving on to items for item for noting. It's a mid-term report on the Climate Emergency Fund, uh, 2021 through 24, and that's in pages 84 to 114 of your packs. I'm going to invite Gillian Simpson to speak to the report. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to update members on the £2 million Climate Emergency Fund. Section 3 provides background on the fund and its development. And Section 4 provides the planned range and scope of areas which the fund was designed to be directed to. And that included um, £680,000 on staffing, including three staff focused on the built environment within housing and technical resources, three staff, um, temporary staff within community and enterprise resources, and the recruitment of a PhD student through Glasgow Caledonian University Centre for Climate Justice, um, with that placement actually due to start at the beginning of December. It also included a community grant fund of £150,000 over two years and the remainder was to be spent on internal grants for council services, including the development of a fund to carry out feasibility studies, match funding for various projects and pilot studies which meet the climate change criteria. Section 5 of the report highlights the actual spend for year 1 of the fund and the committed spend for years 2 and 3. And as you can see in section 5.1, that £1.9 million of the £2 million fund has now been committed. Section 5.2 provides details of the 23 internal projects which have been supported by the fund and a full list of the projects is included in Appendix 1, with additional case studies provided in Appendix 2. Some highlights include a programme of carbon literacy training that's been rolled out for council staff and elected members in conjunction with Keep Scotland Beautiful. A project has been developed to accelerate the introduction of electric vehicles into South Lancashire Fleet. A feasibility study has been carried out and a levelling up funding application has been submitted to create a green action travel project connecting paths and cycle networks in rural South Lanarkshire with neighbouring authorities. That's the Clydesdale Way LUF bid. A tree canopy analysis has been carried out for the South Lanarkshire area, which will help better understand existing canopy cover and where projects need to be targeted in the future. And the Youth Forum on Sustainability and Climate Change has been created with representatives from all our secondary schools and we've been lucky enough to hear from them earlier today. Section 5.3 to 5.5 provides information on the community grants. Um, A full list of the community grants that have been supported and uh, approved for funding is provided in Appendix 3, with supporting case studies again provided in Appendix 4. Some highlights for these include the Ballarup Nursery, who were awarded a grant to develop an allotment and garden area. Blantyre Soccer Academy and Blantyre Bikes Better received funding to run a cycling repair and holiday club. Stonehouse Eco Festival took place in May. This was a community-led initiative to share ideas and promote a greater awareness of climate change issues. Waste Not, Want Not received a grant to purchase equipment for their community reuse and recycle shop in East Kilbride. Section 5.6 covers the next steps for the funding, ensuring that projects which have been awarded funding are progressed and that they achieve the outcomes and benefits outlined by the fund and continuing to promote and administer the Climate Emergency Community Grants to ensure the £75,000 is allocated to projects during 22, 23 and 23, 24. Section 6 and 7 detail the employee and financial implications. Section 8 highlights the climate change and environmental implications and how investment in these grants is helping the Council contribute to national climate change and net zero targets. And if I refer back to recommendations, that is that the mid-term position in respect of the implementation of the Climate Emergency Fund is noted. Thanks, Chair. 
Thank you very much for that, Gillian. Um, can I invite members in the room and online to indicate if they would like to speak on the issue? Uh, first, I'm going to go to Councillor Clark. Hey, thanks, Chair, and thanks for that uh, report. And there's a lot of positive work going on with the uh, with the fund. A lot of good work going on, you know, within the council and supporting our communities, uh, which is obviously really important. I know that the Ecofest, Stonehouse Eco Festival is uh, mentioned, and that's something I and other lots of other councils were able to go to, and that was really useful. in, you know, these different groups being able to get together and you know share things, share ideas, and you know network with each other, and a good thing for able to for councillors to be able to meet all these various groups within our uh, communities. So it'd be a good thing for you know the council to keep supporting events like that going forward. I do have a, a couple questions. I know that uh, a consultant is mentioned quite a lot, and we're appointing, appointing quite a few of them. I'm just wondering what the you know criteria for appointing uh, consultants are, rather than using you know our own officers or people within uh, South Lancashire Council. Although I, I say that, I do uh, look forward to the you know the report on a route map to net zero. I think that will be, you know, really useful in informing the council going forward and how we, you know, do reach net zero. Uh, and also and it mentions, try to get the, the page number up, it mentions ground source heat pumps on page 93 it is. Uh, I know the council are looking at it. I just want to get a, a sense of how ambitious we are. And you know, expanding that is is ground source heat pumps as well as you know, you know, air source uh, heat pumps as well, uh, and how we you know how ambitious we are in expanding that because it can be really useful where it is cost effective, uh, and you know, tackling climate change in general. And then uh, a lot of good work in how we can you know. We can build on a lot of that. That stuff will be re really useful. Uh, thank you. I think that was all my, my questions so far. Thanks very much, Councillor Clark. I think um, my understanding of uh, where a consultant is needed or identified is where there's a, an identifiable need for a, a particular skill set, or in some cases a short term uh, benefit that's out with the, what we have in house. Um, but certainly, I'm going to go to, to David for more on that. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Clark. Yeah, um, uh, as the Chair says, that the, the the use of consultants um, is not something we 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 try to use a lot in terms of external consultants, but we do use them where we don't have the um, either the expertise or the resource in house, uh, and and for usually for uh, for short term specific areas of work where a specialism is required, and and that in that respect. Uh, that 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 uh, relates to the use of consultants in this in this case. Um, in terms of your question about about heat pumps, um, again we're having regular discussions with uh, colleagues in uh, housing and technical resources um, who brought through Stephen Turner a report to the last committee, um, which looks at their journey towards trying to to get to net zero for a building stock, um, and within baked into that um, is. Um, looking at all all forms of new technology, so there is about you know about heat pumps and 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 the use of them where they're required, um, but also in terms of a solar panels, all those different types of technologies that that are available, and sometimes it's a, it's a one is more useful than another in a particular occasions, and sometimes as you'll be aware, it's a multiple a use of different technologies to try to get to where we want to. So, so I do know that heat ground source heat pumps is an area of interest. They're getting more efficient as time goes by, um, but they're only one of a, a suite of different uh, methods that housing and technical resources are looking at at the moment. Thank you much, uh, very much, David. Um, Councillor Allison. Yeah, not a question as such, Chair, but just to actually note the first items there in the appendix where you're working, um, I think, with other councils to put in a UK levelling up fund bid, um, particularly for pathways and cycle paths. Um, it seems to be that the start and stop at the edge of South Lanarkshire and there's no joined up. Uh, and this would be a significant benefit, I think. I think a lot of them go down through uh, my own ward and maybe into Ward 4 as well. So that's very much welcomed. Is there any update on where we are with that fund app application? And secondly, a comment about 
some of the heat pumps, um, those who have installed them note that it can, in their words, significantly increase the cost of uh, heating with, within their houses. So are we mindful of that at the moment um, when uh, when the cost of heating is going through the roof as well, uh, that it may not be the best way of um, supporting uh, those those who are struggling to heat their houses at the moment. Thanks very much, Alec. Um, couldn't agree more with you on the Clydesdale way, um, and I would I would like to see some kind of cross boundary thinking on that one too. So, um, hopefully, that will take place. Um, before, and I'll just pass over to David. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Councillor Allison. Uh, in in respect to the Clydesdale, and again, just to, to echo um, what Marcus said that they um, and and you've said as well. Because last I, I think that'll be an outstanding uh, project uh, if the money comes through from Loft. There's no, there's no white smoke as yet as to when that money. We had hoped that we would be, um, be uh, get some form of announcement um, around about now. We think it might now be into December before we, we would hear anything. But we haven't, uh, we haven't have any indication, formal indication yet. When we'll know the outcome of that bid. Uh, and just on 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 the point on um, your your point on ground source heat pumps, I think that's a useful point to note. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lambie. Hi, right, thanks, Chair. Yeah, so I've got a ground source heat pump, um, and uh, like you know, capital wise, they're incredibly expensive to install in the first place. So you should bear that in mind. Um, the, but the main point I wanted to raise was um, when you're putting all the heating requirements of the house through the electricity through the the grid um you'll, what you'll find out is what i found out is that you can't actually run a car charger and a heat pump at the same time because the volume of electricity supplies to any given house is capped by the size of the cable and the, the amps required you can't actually run a ground source heat pump and a car charger at the same time let alone you know run general electricity in the house I think there's a general rush to try and get everything through the grid. Well, our, you know, our grid network is, you know, 70, 80 years old. But just a word of warning. Thanks very much for that. It is an interesting point. I think we'll maybe have to look at a lot more uh, ways of, of generating power as well and in, in, around residential areas in particular. Um, so as, as society moves forward, um, I'm going to see if, uh, if David wants to comment on that. Um, no, only just to say, Councillor uh, uh, Lambie, yeah, that, that um, we're aware and we're again we're in regular discussions through our, our various uh, networks about the, the the kind of grid and the infrastructure around the grid. So, so we're aware of the points that you you note there in terms of uh, that that is in a, of itself an aging infrastructure that was built not not for for what is required in the future. Um, but but I think that that's known and and that's been trying to be addressed as well through, through various national organisations. Thanks. Thank you very much. I have no more requests. Oh, I do have one. So, Councillor Anderson in the room. Yeah, it's just about these uh, feasibility studies with the external consultants. Will the members of this committee be getting a copy of them from the consultants? Uh, David. Um, yep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Anderson. Um, so, so those those that, that work is ongoing. So, what we will do is we would normally do we, we work that receive with that is that we will we will digest the work into it and bring forward reports to the to the committee. Uh, that may include um, the actual uh, data coming back from the consultants. But sometimes this information we get from consultants needs to be collaborated along with other information we get from other sources to get that full picture. So, um, we we'll certainly be reporting back on the work of the consultants. Thank you very much for that. Um, I see no further questions, so I'll ask committee to agree the report. Great. Thank you very much. Um, finally, to move on to items of urgent business. I did have one request um, on uh, glyphosate and for an update. However, as has been discussed earlier, there's actually, uh, while, it's a, while it's a very important issue, and I say that as the person who introduced the motion in the first place a few years ago, um, it is a very important issue and we do want regular updates. And I'm glad to say that one is forthcoming. It's due at the next 
committee meeting. So for that reason, I, I don't think it would be proper to um, immediately ask officers for an update on where we are today, given that members will have uh, the proper opportunity to scrutinise in depth a detailed report uh, at our very next meeting. So, um, But I am happy to, to talk to any member um, off table about that. Um, should you wish, um, by all means, drop me a line uh, and I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, so with that, I have no further items of business and I thank you all for your attendance and your contributions and I'll bring the meeting to a close. Thank you. Mark.